got to be Pinot Noir. I mean, again, I said that it's already started. I, I, mm -hmm. I think I think many wine writers and, and consumers uh, alike in Canada are aware of the New Zealand Pinots. Do they actually? How much do they really buy? How much do they really drink? I don't know. It's, 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 that's a, sometimes I do a masterclass and ask people, well, how many Pinots have you got in your cellar? Uh, or how much how bottles have you got in total in your cellar? And it, 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 it often appears that the Pinot Noir content is not that large. And if you ask how much they drink, it's even less. But that's changing. I think it's changing. Peeping, stepping away from the big, the big Cabernets, the big Merlots, if they, uh, the big Syrahs, or at least they're buying proportionally a nice portion of Pinot Noirs, new world and old world, uh, in their cellars as well. But Ontario is very much aware, I think, and they like our Pinots, Pinot Noirs, um, in all sort of, in all price points and all quality levels. No, well, there's not nothing as, as uh, there's no, no such thing as an average Pinot. You can't drink average Pinot, I think. But I mean, th there is $100 Pinots and there's $30 Pinots, somewhere in between. Well, lamb, is, lamb comes to mind instantaneously, of course, because, you know, the Pinot and, you know, and a regular lamb, or God knows how you prepare the lamb. There's, there's, there's so many variations. It's fantastic. We have um, locally, we have quite quite upmarket venison farms, with seafood that would with a lightly chilled Pinot, which is what I often do. I often do. I I would chill. I think Pinot with if it has a nice, nice sort of acid uh, backbone a bit, which Pinot ought to have in my book, uh, and a bit more brighter red fruit. Uh, less, less, less that dark plum, then that sort of type of Pinot goes really, really well with uh, with some charry fish or more, uh, yeah, with, with more chewy fish. Um, then um, then I, I wouldn't drink Chardonnay with that. Or, yeah. And if we look that way, that's the Cloudy Bay uh, Sea there, that's the Pacific Ocean right there. And um, there's only a mountain ridge there a couple of miles away that way. And it comes down and there's another ocean there, the, the Testament Sea. So this is in that context, a very, very much different area, the, and that makes gives us a different climate structure as well. The whole maritime, the sea influence, is is fantastically important to what happens in Marlborough, for instance, with the the mountain ranges and sort of horseshoes around us, and then just the sort of normalization, in the, the the calming influence of the of the of the sea. Uh, but it's basically a New Zealand wine growers adapted and voted on standard of. Uh, uh, it started in viticulture, started in the vineyard, and now it's moved into wineries as well. And it's now even it's now well, it's probably going to take further into uh, marketing as well. Mm -hmm. um, it means that there's a lot of things you don't do. It's more about almost more about the things that you should not do, uh, and a couple of things that you that you should do. And so, uh, rather than having all these pesticides, we've gone to, to things like moving our lists and moving things in a row. So. We're more sustainable in that way. We do a lot of work by opening up this canopy so we don't need to put all these um, synthetic petroticides and those sorts of things on. So it's been a real move to let's have a look and see what we've got and then decide what we need to do rather than let's just do stuff because that's historically what, what's happened. New Zealand, New Zealand is known in the world as a clean, green country. And there are, if you let any sort of industry, agriculture industry go, there are, there are threats to that image. So I think from very, very early on, and this is already going on, I think for a decade now, the Zealand wine industry has said, well, we actually market our products as uh, we drink it, you stick it in your mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, very ostensibly, coming from a vineyard, we better protect this image uh, by having very, very uh, audited, uh, very, very rigid rules. They're actually not, not rigid, they're changing and improving and uh, going up in, the, in, in, um, in how they measure it all the time. To protect that image, and actually now we come to the stage of actually sort of using the image for the first time, because you will not be able to. Uh, the New Zealand wine growers will not um, market wines anymore that are not sustainably. I think you, you, you'll be. Uh, I think you can only domestically sell them. You can't export them anymore. So the whole wine industry is as of 2012. So this is for us already taking effect from 2009, 2010 wine-wise. That if you want in 2012 to sell 2010 wines. They have to be sustainably grown, sustainably made, and sustainably accredited winery, and that's all measured and audited yearly. It's a very rigid program. That and oh, you can always go more rigid. You can uh, you can go for a biodynamic certification and all the way through whatever. But as a country, as a country, not just as a region and one little vineyard, as a country to do this rule, that's unique. Having to be able to 
hand this land to your children, the next generation, says farmers, why would we wreck our land and then leave our children without? So, so it's all about it's about, it's about a balance. It's, I hate that word balance has been used too often in the wine industry, but it's all about balancing the human intervention and uh, and, and to get to a fantastic gla a glass a glass of wine. Uh, best markets, markets plural, I think would be. If, you can, if I am allowed to combine the provinces of Canada, that's probably, that's probably for the, the province of Canada, although they have this funny, funny monopoly system, is for a boutique player, if you have the right agent, it's a very good market. 